So this week we're talking about some of these uh, really popular historic DOM and JavaScript libraries. And um, the, the readings are here. The readings are really good. I, I'm not going to duplicate the readings. So I assume you can go through and you can read about each of these. So what I want to do instead is I want to talk a bit about them and show you some example code. And um, so we're talking specifically about uh, Bootstrap, jQuery, Lodash or underscore, you'll see it referred to in both ways, Moment.js, etc. And I want to say something about version numbers. So uh, the documentation for this week talks about Bootstrap 3, but there's Bootstrap version 4, and now the beta of, of Bootstrap 5 is out. Probably by the time you're watching this, uh, Bootstrap 5 will be shipped. So Whenever we're talking about anything related to the web, you have to understand that the versions change constantly. And the best thing you can do for yourself is you can get used to reading the official documentation for things. So we have, we have great notes this week that talk about these things, but there is no substitute for you getting good at going to whatever it is you're working on and going straight to the docs. And it's interesting, I find that a lot of times when I'm working with students and they're getting started at this stuff, what they're looking for is they're looking for an answer to a problem. So where do you go? Stack Overflow, you Google something, you, you land on some random website and you take their advice and that's it. Well, there's another way to go about this and that is for you to dig deeper into the underlying technology. So if you're going to be studying jQuery or React or Angular or Bootstrap or any of these technologies, they all have amazing documentation. So the first place you should go is you should go to the actual docs and you should read about it. So if there are changes in the API between version four and version five, it'll talk about those things. You'll be able to figure out how to, how to download it, how to install it, how to use it, etc. And don't be afraid of the docs. At this stage of your programming career, you need to get really comfortable with technical reading technical documentation. Don't only read tutorials. Don't only read Stack Overflow. Don't only read blog posts about things. Uh, you can go right to the actual docs. And in fact, you can also go to the code and read the code itself, which is another great way to understand what's going on with some of this stuff. Okay, so we're talking about these libraries. And I want to say something again about versions. I talked about it uh, in the last video a little bit, and that is that a lot of these libraries are starting to get dated. And I wanted to talk about things being dated on the web and, you know, how do you prioritize what you should learn and what's, what's worth doing and what's not worth doing. So I thought it might be interesting to look at some, some numbers. So the 2020 Almanac was published recently. So this is coming out of last year. And what they did was they analyzed 7.5 million websites and they looked at all aspects of it. So it's, it's actually a really amazing document. If you want to go and read through it, they talk about their statistics on all sorts of things. Um, if you go to the, well, the table of contents, like they talk about CSS, JavaScript, fonts, privacy, mobile web, like all kinds of things that, that are going on. So I wanted to pick up on one specific thing right now with what we're doing, and that is talking about libraries. So here are the, here's the breakdown of what they found when they looked at these 7.5 million websites. So as you can see here, what we have is adoption of the top JS frameworks and libraries on desktop and mobile. And you can see that the very largest piece here is jQuery, 83% of those websites, 7.5 million websites are using jQuery. This is seriously shocking to me. If you look down here, you'll see moment.js is here, underscore is here, lodash is here, they're in the 4% range, react coming in at 4%, etc. So I wanna talk about what's going on here because if you go looking for a job today, what you're gonna see is you're gonna see people asking for react, angular, they're gonna be asking for tools, Vue, all sorts of modern things. But then if you go and you analyze what's on the web, like if you just look at the, you know, the, the web as a whole, what do you find? It turns out that people make code, it works, and then they leave it and it just sits there. Uh, and if something's working and it's not broken, a lot of people just keep using it. 
So there are generational changes on the web. I could go through and talk about some of them. With the modules, we did talk about a few of the ways that people have evolved um, how this stuff gets done. But jQuery was solving a problem in the early days of the web where there were huge inconsistencies between browsers and the way that things were implemented. So if you were in, uh, if you specifically if you were using older versions of Internet Explorer or you were using uh, other browsers, there were huge differences in the way that they did things. And so jQuery was trying to provide a unified approach to what the browser would allow. And it was trying to extend it so you could do really interesting things that the browser didn't allow. Since then, a lot of the ideas that jQuery pioneered have made their way into the browser. So a good example of this is Query Selector, document.querySelector, where the CSS3 query selector language has been like brought into the DOM as a first class member. jQuery started that, being able to query for IDs and class names and so on um, using dollar and then whatever uh, selector you wanted to use. So these ideas start out in libraries, they get pulled into the, the native uh, web platform and so on, but people continue to use it because you know, it's like muscle memory. After you've used jQuery on lots and lots of sites, you reach for it all the time. So there are, you know, there's like 15 years of people who have been, you know, doing this kind of stuff with jQuery and they want to keep doing it. So you can see that here. So sites like WordPress use it. I mean, Bootstrap up until I think version five, I think one of the things that version five does is it removes jQuery and previous versions of Bootstrap require jQuery, like you have to pull in jQuery as well. So this is why we're looking at this stuff, because when you go out there and you go to a company and a company has uh, a big web app and they say to you, we want you to modify it or we want you to do something with this system that we have, you're going to run into these technologies. And even if you wouldn't choose to use them on new code today, like if I was building a site today, I don't think I would use jQuery. In fact, I don't. I would probably use React for a lot of things, or I would just do it in uh, vanilla JavaScript in the DOM because the DOM and JavaScript are so capable now. I don't need to use these um, shim layers or these polyfill layers on top of them. So anyway, all of that, I wanna, I wanna look at this, I wanna talk about that. I showed you this in the previous video as well, but this is downloads, you know, daily downloads from NPM of these different libraries. And you can see that like this is Lodash, this is jQuery, like. Uh, 16 million downloads a day just from NPM. And there's lots of people that are doing it other ways through CDNs or they're hosting it locally and so on. Even moment.js, you know, here you've got almost 4 million uh, over here. Yeah, almost four, you know, three and a half million downloads a day from NPM. So lots and lots of people are still using these things. And at the end of this discussion, I'm going to talk to you about ways in which you can you know, get around using them today in a lot of cases or, or how they've become uh, less necessary. But having said that, let's, uh, let's jump in and take a look at them. So a quick thing about uh, ways of including them based on what we talked about before. So if you go to the jQuery page uh, and you go to the download page, you'll see that it gives you a bunch of different ways to um, include this. If you scroll down through it, you'll see different um, different possibilities for, uh, for how they recommend that you include it. And I'll just um, show you an example of one of the ways that, um, that people include it. Let me switch my view here. So if I say I have a web page like this and I want to include jQuery in it, one of the things that I can do is I can include it as a script to a CDN. So let me just make this so it's a little more readable. And explain what it is that we're seeing here. Okay, so here's one way that people use uh, jQuery. Like if you, if you go to Bootstrap, like let me try and find an older, if I go to the four, version four of, um, of Bootstrap, you'll see that you have to include jQuery as one of the prerequisites. And you can see that they have this interesting way of doing it. So they include here a source, they include 
integrity and they include cross origin. So source you know about. This is the, you know, the source code that we want to include. But how about these other two? So the integrity is what's known as sub-resource integrity. So when you're loading a script from a third party, in this case, I'm writing a web app and I'm I'm relying on this web server to serve me jQuery. But what if that server decided to serve me malware? Like what if they got hacked? And now instead of getting jQuery, when my website loads, it loads a Bitcoin miner or it loads something that installs an executable uh, on people's browsers, etc. Like terrible stuff that we don't want to have happen. So what we can do is we can use what's called uh, sub-resource integrity where we say, okay, this here is a hash a hash being, if I take the source code to jQuery and I run it through a hashing function, I'm gonna get back a string, which has to be, so this string here, starting here, I guess, is it, it's gonna be the same every time we give it the same input. But if the input changes, we're gonna get drastically different output. So this line of code tells the browser, download this file and then hash it. And if the hash that you get back looks like this, then it's safe to use it. It hasn't been tampered with. So this is common when people use uh, resources from a CDN as a way of uh, validating them, that they can trust that they're, they are what they say they are. The last thing you'll sometimes see people do is they put in this cross origin equals anonymous. And what this is doing is, this again has to do with cores. So I'm writing code on a particular website and I wanna load it from another origin from HTTPS code.jQuery.com. So that's an origin. This is gonna come, this is gonna to come to me cross origin. I'm gonna to have to cross from my current security origin into the other origin. And so what I'm saying here is, when I make this request, do it anonymously. In other words, don't send any cookies along with the, with the request for this script. So normally if I have a bunch of cookies set on my, um, on the origin where my, uh, where my, you know, where my site is running or my web app is running, every time I do uh, any kind of uh, I send things over to the server, I want to send back those cookie values. But if I'm doing this and I'm sending it cross origin, I can say that I want to do that anonymously so that I don't share or leak any information from this origin to a server running in another origin. Okay. So this is one way that we could use uh, jQuery. So another way we could use jQuery, I'm just going to go to uh, data rendering and I'll go to the web app. So another thing you could do is you could say npm install jQuery. So it installs jQuery and then what did that do? So if you, go, if you look inside node modules, I have a whole bunch of modules that have been installed here, but one of the ones that we're gonna find if we look in here is jQuery and here it is right here. So if we go into, um, node modules jQuery, and we have a look around, you'll see that what we get is we get a source directory and we get a disk directory. So the disk directory is what we want. So if I um, were to go into dist and take a look at what's in there, you'll see that all these different versions of jQuery are there. And so I could use jQuery, jQuery.min, the minified one, or a slim version of it, etc. So another thing that you'll see people do is they will, instead of doing this, they'll install it from, uh, they'll install it with npm and then they'll say node modules slash jQuery slash dist slash jQuery.min.js. So that's another way that I could do it where I use NPM to install and pull that down for me automatically. If I go up a level um, and I take a look at their package.json file, here's their package.json file. And you'll notice here that they have specified that if you are using this, uh, if you are using this as a module, like this, there's a lot of stuff that's defined here, but if you're using this as a mo like you're including this in your in your bundling and you're you know using something like Parcel to do this, then it it's automatically going to use the dist slash jQuery JS file when it uh, when it includes that. So what would that look like? Uh, just to show you. 
So let's say I had a file um, index.js and my index.js file is here. And I said something like um, const jQuery equals require jQuery. <clears throat> so when you do that, what it's gonna do is it's gonna pull jQuery in from the node modules jQuery dist uh, jQuery and you'll be able to use it. So now I could do whatever I wanna do with jQuery uh, when I'm you know, inside of my inside of my bundle or inside of the code that I'm writing. Uh, okay, so let's talk about Lodash. Lodash is really interesting in terms of the ways, all the different ways that I can include it. So um, first thing you can do is, let's just keep doing our example here. If I have an index page, uh, that's not what I want. Um, let's do it over here. So index page. So if I wanted to load it from a CDN, I could load it from a CDN um, with a link. So for example, here I could say, like that, you know, so load load this file from a CDN. Another thing I could do is I can npm install it. So I could say npm install dash dash save uh, lodash. And it pulls down lodash. So if I was going to, let's just go back here to my index. So I could say const lodash, or I could say const uh, underscore like that equals require lodash. So I could pull in lodash, you know, from npm when I do that, if I wanted to, this is, this is one way that we could do it. So just to show you what would happen if I were to jump into node and I said require, if I said const underscore equals require lodash, and if I said lodash dot um, whatever, lodash, lodash is basically this object that has all these different functions on it. So I can grab any one of these functions and, and work with it. So for example, I could say, you know, underscore dot replace is a function that takes ABC and it looks for BC and, and you know, replace that with the empty string. And so, you know, it does something like that. The replace function, is on this object. So another thing that people do is they will, uh, Lodash lets you also do the following. So you'll see people do this. They'll say const replace equals, and then they'll say require Lodash slash replace like that. So replace is just this function. Um, I've pulled in a single function instead of pulling in all the different aspects of it. So the way that uh, Lodash is packaged up, let me just show you here. Uh, where are you, Lodash? Here's Lodash. So Lodash has all of these different functions. Uh, like for example, I'm talking about replace. You'll see replace, <laughs> a lot of them. Uh, replace is here. So this is the replace function in Lodash. And so I can, if I want to, I can just say Lodash slash replace and it will pull in just that one function. And people are really sensitive to how much space different things take. So um, this is why they often will only pull in, you know, pieces of what they need. Okay, so another thing about Lodash, when you scroll down, you'll see that I can also get it as a, a set of ES modules. So there is a Lodash-ES, and this thing, it doesn't really have any docs on it, so let me just show you how it works. So if I were to install this, if I said npm install um, Lodash-ES, And then if I were to go into like my, in my web app, let's say here, let's say that instead of uh, working with require, let's say that I wanted to do ES style. So now I can say import underscore from Lodash ES. 
So I can import it as an ES module. Or if I wanted to, I could say import the replace function from low dash ES like that. I have to spell from collect correctly, etc. cetera. Um, you'll, I mean, I could also do import replace from low dash ES slash replace. So I could do that as well. So there are all these different ways that you can pull this in and you can work with it. So you're gonna see people doing, you know, doing different versions of it. The same thing is true with Moment.js. When you go to look at Moment.js and you look at uh, the docs for Moment.js, Moment.js is here, docs. Um, actually, it's funny, the first thing they give you when you go to this page is they give you a big project status that essentially says, you know, you might not need this anymore. Like there are other ways to do this now. So the project is kind of in maintenance mode now, still a fantastic library, but um, there are other, other ways of doing it, including, you know, not using any library at all, just using the built-in things that the browser has or JavaScript has right now. Um, but here again, if I wanted to, I could install moment as a, um, let's just pull it in as a CDN link. Pull it in like that. So that would work. Or if I was going to, you know, if I wanted to install this, I could say npm install save moment. And I could require it. So if I, you know, require moment, and it brings in this big object, and this object has all these different functions that I can call. So it has lots and lots of stuff. Moment is a fantastic way of working with adding dates together, getting the time difference between these different things, and so on. So the reason that people are afraid of these, there's a really good uh, site called Bundlephobia, and you can type in the name of a package like moment and it'll tell you how big this thing is. So like if you use moment, um, you're adding like 288 kilobytes of JavaScript to your project. So oftentimes people use one little function out of moment.js or lodash or whatever, and they don't need all the rest of it. So what you're, what you're trying to do is you're trying to reduce as much as you can the amount of JavaScript that you ship um, and you can see here, they give you estimates, like if somebody's on 2G or if they're on 3G, how long it would actually take for uh, downloading this thing. So every, you know, everything that you add to your project is gonna take more time and it's gonna, it's gonna be bigger for you to use it. Okay, having said all that, what I have here today is, uh, I have some code examples from this week to walk through. So if you go to the main Web422 page on GitHub, and you go to the code examples. In week two's code examples, there are examples of using all of these different APIs that I wanted to just quickly go through and show you. So you can get some examples of what it looks like to work with these. So after you've read through the notes this week and you understand how all of these libraries work, you can have a look at um, seeing them in use over here. So let me just clean this up a little bit so that we can... Okay, so the first thing I'm gonna show you is we have this web API uh, here, and I'm gonna start up this web API. It's running on localhost 8080. Uh, okay, so let's just take a look at it. Uh, the server is here. So this is the theaters API that we looked at last time, API theaters gives me back all of these different theaters. And if I ask for a specific theater, like say this theater here uh, by ID, then I just get back that one theater. So this is all working using Express. All of the routes have been defined. So they're returning JSON. So we have get routes, post routes, put, delete. So we have basically a CRUD app that's got a REST API sitting in front of it. So I'm gonna leave this web server running on localhost 8080. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run another app. So inside week two, uh, week two, there is the data rendering 
directory. And inside here, there's a web app. So CD web app, like so. And um, the package.json file is really small. I've, I've added in one dependency here, and that is serve. The serve dependency I have, these other dependencies are just because I was fooling around a minute ago with um, showing you how to install things. But the serve dependency allows me to do it to statically serve a web app. So if you're writing a little uh, static website and you, you need a web server to serve it, you can write a script like this and you can say, uh, whenever I start my whenever I start my project, I wanna serve the current directory and it'll serve index.html. Or you could also say, if you don't have a package file, you could say mpx serve would, would work too. And it would run download and run the serve uh, server, the static server to do this. So I'm gonna say npm start and I'll pull up the uh, page for this localhost 5000. Okay, good. So let me take you through what's going on here and we'll just walk through this code. So inside the web app, we've got index.html and index.html is loading um, jQuery, it's loading bootstrap, it's loading lodash, and it's also loading a script that we're writing. So a bunch of these scripts are coming from CDNs and then main.js is being executed. So if I go into main.js, that's where we'll that's where we'll focus what we're doing right now. Okay, so let's take a look at this code. So in jQuery, what we have is we have this global. So jQuery exposes itself on the global as this dollar sign. So it was really hip and cool back in the day to use single character global exports. So that's what underscore does and that's what jQuery does. So whenever you see an underscore or a dollar sign, that's, what, that's probably what it refers to. But one of the difficulties with this global style is that we don't see where this is defined. So what you'll sometimes see people do is up at the top of their file, they'll say global, they'll have a comment and they'll say global dollar like that. And so they'll tell other tools and other developers that this is being defined globally somewhere else. In our case, it's being defined, not here, but it's being defined here. So when we load in jQuery right here, that dollar sign is gonna get added or exported onto the global, which is the reason we can use it when we're looking over here. Okay, so down here it says dollar, and then it has this interesting code here. So jQuery gives us what it calls a ready function. So in, you know, if I was gonna write this in, um, it's kind of like saying window.onload equals function like that. And so putting my code in here, but jQuery gives us this handy way of saying when the DOM is ready, uh, I wanna do this stuff, but the stuff I'm about to do requires the DOM to be ready because we're gonna do things with DOM nodes. So you can see right here, for example, that it's doing things with DOM nodes. In this case, it's looking for the element that has an ID of theaters, table, uh, and then the table body inside that. So if I was in here, console, if I said dollar and I did uh, theaters, table, T body, like that, you can see that it returns back to me this uh, it returns back to me this jQuery wrapped object for the DOM node. And if I did the same thing in pure JavaScript, I would say document.query selector um, theaters table t body. It gives me back a raw DOM node. So these are kind of doing the same thing. I'm using the selector, but what jQuery gives me that's really nice is it gives me this higher level DOM API. So I can call a bunch of other uh, functions on this. Like for example, what you can see happening here is when the DOM is ready, I'll skip this, this line for a second, but what it says here is go get the table body, like this, this element right here, go get the table body and then add a click handler on all of the table rows. 
So if anybody clicks on one of these table rows, I wanna call this function here. And what this does is it gets uh, some information from the table, uh, it gets the data ID member, which so I'll talk about this in a second, and it console logs it. So you can see over here, if I click on any of these, oh, we have a bug in our code, which is nice, that needs to be fixed. Uh, it, I wonder why that's not working. So this is something we'll have to debug as we go through. But for now, I'm not gonna worry about, I'm not gonna worry about it. Um, the click handler is attached and ready to go. Okay, so when this DOM loads, the first thing it does is it initializes the theater's model. It calls this function up here. And you can see here that it's doing a, a fetch. So this is using um, code that's in the DOM as opposed to code that is in jQuery. jQuery has an Ajax function and the fetch is, uh, we could have done it either way. In this case, this code isn't using pure jQuery to do it. So it's gonna go to our theaters API and it's gonna request this data. So it fetches this data. When the response comes back, it parses it into JSON. And once that has been completed, it calls the refresh theater rows and it passes in the, the theater data that's been there. So then what's happening in here is it grabs that table body again and it empties it of all of its contents. So like we could do the same thing here. If I were to grab uh, this and I said empty, you can see that it deletes it. It deletes all the data that's there. We grab this element, we empty it of all of its contents. And now what we do is we use this really cool function inside of Lodash. So let's just pull up the docs for Lodash and look at the template function. So the template function is neat. So it creates a compiled template that can interpolate data properties and HTML escapes are interpolated. Essentially, it's gonna allow me to write this really compact template, which will be used to produce the data that I, uh, be used to produce the data that we're gonna get in the page. So like when I load this page, let's reload it. You can see that all of these elements, like this element here has been, it's been created. We have a table row and it's getting the ID from the theater. So you see that it's taking theaters from the scope of the function, like it's inside the scope, it gets this from here and it's going to loop through all of the elements of the theaters. It's going to get a, an individual theater, and then it's gonna generate this HTML uh, like so. So a table row, put the, the theater's ID into the, into the data attribute here like this, and then it creates these TDs. So we have table data for the theater ID and for the street address. And it does that over and over for each one of these things. And if I was gonna try and write something like this, so if I had, I would have to do something like theaters dot for each theater. And I would have to do something along the lines of, I would say, um, you know, let HTML is equal to this empty string. And here I would say, um, let's copy this. And I would say something like HTML plus equals. And I would have to use a different kind of string uh, interpolation. So I would do, I would do theater ID like that. And down here, I would do theater.theater ID like that. Like that. And then I would uh, something like that. So, you know, this, 
this is one of the things people like about Lodash is it gives you some ways of doing this. And before it wasn't possible to do to use template literal strings like this, where you could interpolate inside um, where you could interpolate inside of a uh, inside of a string. And I'd have to deal with things like here. I'm not I'm not dealing with like escaping the HTML. So it's going to be proper. Like there's a bunch of work here. So this this kind of thing is still used a lot. Like people love this. If you need to do if you need a templating engine built into the browser, you can use Lodash's templating to be able to generate lots of nodes uh, like like you're seeing happening here. So this I won't actually do. I'll just comment this out. But I wanted to at least show you what what some of the equivalent of that would look like. And then you can see that we're using Lodash and jQuery together to be able to um, here after it generates after like it it generates this template function and then it calls the template function using theaters, and then down here we grab the body and we inject this HTML into the generated HTML right into the DOM. So you know. Instead of having to build those DOM nodes ourselves, um, jQuery is going to do that for us using uh, this.html. And so, if I just to show you, if I were to do this, if I were to say .html, you can see that I can either set or get the value, the HTML that goes in there. So, right now it's pulling out the HTML that's in there. And if I were instead to say, um, you know, paragraph, hello world. It's, it's going to change the HTML that's inside there and give me here. Now I have the table body just has this one uh, paragraph element in it, which is really neat. So um, let's figure out I want to figure out why this isn't working when I click on it. So let me reload this just out of interest. So I click on this and I get null. So my let's try and figure out why. So inside my code here, um, let's set some breakpoints and try and understand this code. So I want to set a breakpoint. Whenever I have a click event, I want to go here, line 46. So I'm going to click right here. So it's going to drop me into the debugger. And you'll see that I get my uh, my event is firing. And so E, this is the event which has the original uh, element that, that uh, caused it. Like if I say E.target, you'll see this is the this is the um, the element that is that is returning. Like this TD is the one that is is coming back. OK. Um, all right, so let's figure out let's figure out what's going on here. So I'm going to go back into my sources. And so it says let theater equal. So it's, it's going to call this function and it's going to pass in this and it's going to get the data attribute for this. So let's step into this function. So I'm going to step into uh, this function. Now, what it's done here is it's dropped me into uh, jQuery. And I don't really want to be in jQuery. So it says, this is a minified file. Do you want to pretty print it? And I could say, yeah, pretty print it. So if I wanted to debug jQuery, which I really don't, then I could come in here. But what I really want to do is I actually want to go to the first line of this function here. So right now I'm inside this part of the function call. I'm going to, I'm going to play forward until I get dropped in here. So you'll see that after this runs, it's passing in an ID value like so, I have this ID value. And it says, um, let's loop through the theaters model dot length. And if the theaters model at ID is equal to this, then we'll do the following. So already I can see that this has to be my bug. I have an array of zero. So it's going to step over this. It's never going to run this code. And it's going to come down here and uh, return null. Okay, so let's figure out theater's model is defined up at the top of the file here. And I 
think that I have broken this code <clears throat> because, so here's what's happening. We're fetching the library. We're fetching the JSON rather. We're parsing the JSON and we're getting back the, uh, the data. <clears throat> Excuse me, we're getting back this data. And so what I didn't do here is I didn't cache this value. So instead of having an, uh, I'm going to say uh, theaters model equals data. And then here I'm going to pass in the theaters model like that. Let's try running this again and see what happens. So I'm going to refresh this. I don't need a breakpoint down here anymore. I'm only interested in this part right here. So I'm going to rerun this. Refresh the page. I'm going to click on this. And now what I'm really interested in, okay, this looks way better. So theaters model dot length. So if I were to go over here and say theaters model, you can see that I have an array with 20 elements in it. That's exactly what should happen. So if I were to let this run now, so it's going to loop through and it's going to do a check and say, if this equals this item, it's going to do a clone and it's going to return it. And if I look at the console, it's printed out the object which is exactly what I expect it to do. I want it to log that, that theater. So it's unfortunate that I've uh, got some, uh, I have a bug in my code, but at the same time, it's good because I wanted to talk to you, you know, a little bit about getting good at using the debugger and understanding how to debug front end code. You're gonna see me use the debugger a lot when I'm going through and working on uh, all the different code examples that we're gonna do. And so I'll actually fix up the, this is a, a, a bug that I introduced when I was uh, working on these notes last night. So I'll, I'll fix those on GitHub so that it doesn't have that. Okay, so that's Lodash, jQuery, and so on. And read through the notes for jQuery and Lodash, but I want to show you a couple of other examples, some other example code that we have. So in addition to this web app, We also have um, a Lodash example. So if you go look at the Lodash example, I'm just gonna start this Lodash example. And this is running on localhost 5000. And let me get rid of this breakpoint and run this code. Okay, so when this opens up, you really won't see anything, you'll just see the page. And what we've done in this page if you go and look at the lodash.js main.js, is we have a whole bunch of examples of different ways of running this code. And what I would encourage you to do is to step through this code in the debugger and watch how it works. So a really simple way when you're debugging and you're writing code, if you ever want to automatically stop somewhere in your code, you can just use the debugger keyword. So when, if I save this and if I reload this, so first of all, if I don't have my dev tools open, if I load this, nothing different will happen. Like nothing happens. But if I have my dev tools open and you put the debugger keyword in like this, then what's gonna happen when you, when you load the page is you'll see that I'm automatically dropped into the debugger at this location. So it's like you've set a breakpoint, but you can set a breakpoint in code. Obviously you're not going to do this when you're shipping production code. So the only time that I use debugger like this is if I know that I want to automatically drop into the debugger at a particular spot in my code, I'll just throw the debugger keyword. So if I wanted to, you know, if I wanted to break right here, I throw a debugger in like that and then I refresh the page and you'll see that I'm now down here. What's nice about this is it's possible for me to see what's going on inside my code. So you can see, for example, that users is an array of three elements, and I can go and I can look at all of these elements here, or in the console, if I want to do something with users or users at zero, I can, I can get access to those things and I can, I can work with them. So when you're trying to debug or understand how this code works, you can do that. I can tell it to step over to the next line. So I can say, okay, jump over this line and go to the next line. And it, you'll notice that it hasn't executed this line yet. It's going to execute this line. And you'll see over here, whoops, let me go back again. 
You'll see over here that all of my local variables are defined. Like for example, chunk one doesn't currently have a value, whereas users does have a value. If I step over this line, it'll execute that code and you'll see that chunk one now does have a value, whereas chunk two doesn't have a value. So I can go and, you know, I can step through, step over these things. I can set breakpoints deep inside of a function. So for example, here, I need to, if I wanted to look inside this function when it gets called, I can set a breakpoint here and then I can jump to that breakpoint, like play forward to that breakpoint. Or if I wanna jump out of that breakpoint, set a breakpoint further down and hit play and go back down to that one there. So there's lots and lots of neat things that we can do when you're trying to understand this. And I think that the, the example here, when you wanna see, like for example, the take, how do I understand take? Like if you go to Lodash and you look at the documentation for take, it says creates a slice of an array with n elements taken from the beginning. So you give it an array and, and the number of elements that you wanna take from the beginning. So if we look at this code here, it says take users two. So users has three elements in it. It says it's gonna take two elements in it. So I can step over this and now take one should have two elements in it and it does have two elements in it. So you can just play around with this code and you can see how it works you can step through and watch it line by line in order to understand what's going on. Lots and lots of cool things. Pick, anyway, I won't go through them all, but I'll let you try them out. As you're reading the notes, you can come back here and you can play with it. You could modify this code, save it, go back to the browser, reload the page, try it out, see how it works. Okay. I have a similar one for moment.js. So if I, uh, moment. Moment has the same basic structure. I'm gonna get rid of these breakpoints and reload the page. And you'll see that I have a page that has code that does the same sort of thing with moment. And if you uncomment that debugger keyword here and reload this page, you'll have the same basic idea where you can jump through and watch how moment does what it does. And all of these things, like if I wanted to call moment here, because moment is uh, defined in the global scope, I can access it. So I can, I can go ahead and I can um, work with it in the console. If I wanted to try out things that are going on in, uh, in here, or if I wanted to get access to an object that I'm looking at. So oftentimes when I'm, trying to debug this stuff, you can also show the console drawer. So if you wanna have the debugger and the console drawer up at the same time, and if you're feeling like this is too tight, you can also um, break this out into its own window. So if you wanna undock this and you wanna make this uh, larger so that you can really step through and debug your code, you can do that as well. And often I will do that when I'm, when I'm trying to really understand some difficult bug and I want to be able to go through bit by bit and see what's going on, uh, I'll, I'll do that. To get it back in place, you just go here and you tell it to dock back into the bottom of the window or the side of the window or whatever you want to do for the, uh, the amount of space that you have. So I'll ask that you go through and take a look at the readings for the week and this code example, and really try and just get a sense of what's possible with, uh, with the library for being able to format things, work with localized dates, and, uh, and so on. So the last thing I wanted to mention to you is um, there's a series of websites. You might not need Lodash. You might not need jQuery. You might not need or you don't need moment.js. And what a lot of these do is they show you, like for example, you might not need Lodash. It shows you how you would do something in Lodash and how you would do something in plain JavaScript. And so if you wanna understand how do I uh, replace Lodash or what is Lodash really doing, you can get a sense of, of, of what each of these functions is and how you would do it in just you know regular plain old JavaScript. Similar thing for moment.js. Moment.js, you can, replace, it's really, like I told you before, it's really big. And there are smaller libraries that you can use um, that 
you, you know, so that you don't have to pull in so many dependencies when you're trying to make sense of this. Like for example, uh, sometimes I will use date functions. Date functions is another library that's very similar to moment, but you know, if I just want to get the amount of time that has happened between a few days, I don't necessarily need to pull in the entire moment JS library. I just need some piece of functionality. And so I'll pull that in and get so that I can say something like this happened three days ago or 15 minutes ago or whatever it is like that for pretty printing those dates. So take a look at these things and remember what I'm what I'm saying to you about uh, you don't I don't become religious with I'm only going to do it this way or I'm only going to use this. I'm only going to use modern things because I'll tell you the funny thing about modern things is they very be quickly become legacy things like everything that you're learning right now is going to be replaced in three to five years, which is totally depressing. But welcome to technology. In my career, everything I know has been replaced many, many, many times. And I constantly have to relearn everything I know about how to do web development or software in general. So if you take the stance that it's good to learn how these tools work, how you can like take the best of what jQuery does, the best of what Moment does, and you know, you'll find that people still use that code in lots of places. And it's good for you to understand how to use it. So don't get into the sense, okay, I'm only going to work with this one particular way of doing things. The more ways you can learn to do these things, the better, because all of them target the underlying web platform. And so the more you know about how the web platform works and how different approaches to using it work, the stronger you're going to be as a developer, because you're going to be able to, you're going to have deeper understanding of what's going on versus just memorizing syntax for one framework or uh, one library. Okay, I'll pause it there and I'll get you to go through and, um, you know, take a look, take a look through the readings, take a look through the code examples for week two, make sure you're understanding what's going on and you'll be able to use them when you're doing assignments or working on other pieces of code.